Intermittent fasting has gained a lot of popularity in recent years, but is it right for you? If so, how can you get started today in a healthy way? This is the 5 a.m. Miracle, episode number 362, Weight Loss and Intermittent Fasting with Dr. Katrina Ubel. Good morning, I am Jeff Sanders, and this is the podcast dedicated to dominating your day before breakfast. My guest today is a master certified life and weight loss coach and host of the popular Weight Loss for Busy Physicians podcast. After completing her pediatric residency at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, she worked in a private pediatric practice for 10 years, during which time she lost 45 pounds in 12 months without surgery, pills, unhealthy crash diets, or fitness apps. Now she leverages her experience as a pediatrician and as a mother to help other busy doctors prioritize their health and achieve permanent weight loss. And now here is my interview with Dr. Katrina Ubel. Jeff, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So let's just dig into your personal story with intermittent fasting first. I guess, when did this come on your radar? When did you first begin to kind of dig into it yourself? And and then did it actually help you? Yeah. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a medical doctor myself and never learned anything about fasting as a doctor at all. It wasn't until I actually became a life coach, <laughs> hmm. strangely enough, right? Very strange story that I started learning. I just started being, I guess, more open to other ideas for how to create long lasting, not only weight loss, but like weight maintenance. Cause my story was that I struggled with my weight up and down. I mean, just again and again and again, 40 pounds up and down for literally decades. And so I was approaching 40 years old. And I was just like, okay, clearly what I've been doing as a Lifetime Weight Watchers member just is not working for me. Maybe I need to explore some other ideas. And that was right about when this kind of movement for intermittent fasting was just getting going. It was right when that idea was out there. And so, you know, just like anybody else, I'm like, well, that sounds disordered. Is this just like a hidden covered up eating disorder? Like what is, you know, like, I, especially as a doctor, right? Like it's, you know, I, I'm like, well, hold on a second. Like what's actually going on here? So I read a number of books and and um, just, you know, kind of immerse myself in the idea a little bit more. And what I found was that um, it actually meshed perfectly with the people that I was serving as a life coach, which is busy doctors who are in clinical practice who struggle with their weight. And I was one of them. I, as a doctor, as a pediatrician, I was, you know, trying all kinds of things to lose weight and nothing really worked. I had worked with a nutritionist once and she's like, well, you know, in the afternoon you need to eat a snack. And I was just like, Okay, but when, you know, I mean, you have a child, right? Like yeah. when when it's, you know, you've been waiting 30 minutes at the pediatrician's office and it's nap time or they're hungry or whatever. Like, I you know, I'm not just going to like stop and go eat something. Like when I have, <laughs> you know, all these rooms full of patients, like it just, you know, could I do it? Of course I could, but I just wasn't going to do that. And I kept thinking like, why does this have to be so complicated? Like, does, is it really that difficult to learn how to eat like a naturally thin person and be naturally thin? Like I just, I just didn't <laughs> seem to understand it. And uh, so I started thinking, you know, I wonder if this intermittent fasting thing could be really, really useful because what ends up happening for doctors and for basically so many other people in the world is that like things come up throughout the day. All of a sudden there's an emergency or, you know, a meeting runs over or something happens and you aren't able to have the time to prepare a meal or consume a meal, right? Like it takes a while to eat a salad. You can't just like wolf that down in three minutes. Um, And so then you end up either making choices that aren't great or you end up not eating and then you don't do it in a way that really supports you, you end up getting overly hungry, then you're so hungry that you're just eating whatever's in sight, you know, including all the you know sugary things or things that don't really serve your body. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to experiment with this first and see what I think. And what I found was that it was absolutely amazing. So what I'll tell you is that my my experience of it, you know, and like I say, I was, I was a skeptic. I'm like, so what is this going to be like? You know, I was kind of expecting it to not be that great. And I ended up being so pleasantly surprised because what I found was, you know, rather than what we all believe is going to happen if we don't eat, which is that we think we're going to not have energy. We're going to feel like super, um, you know, tired. We're not going to be able to think clearly because we're just thinking about needing to eat something constantly. Like it's actually the opposite that happens when your body is what I call fat adapted, meaning that it is happy to access your fat stores instead of processing a meal. So what that means is, right, like when you're a sugar burner, 
you, you know, you're hungry and it feels like an emergency, like you want to chew your arm off, right? People talk about like being hangry, the combination of hungry and angry, or like your stomach is going to eat your spine because you're like so, so hungry. It, you know, if you think about it, it really doesn't make sense from an evolutionary standpoint for us to feel that hungry if we haven't eaten for just a couple of hours, right? Like, like think about, you know, how scarce food was for the vast majority of the time that humans have existed, so why can't we go, you know, like more than four or five hours without eating something? Like it just doesn't make sense. So what I found was that it was the opposite that was true. I found that my energy was so much better, very, very even. I felt like I was able to think more clearly. I was not actually hungry and not thinking about food. And then when I did eat a meal, I was like very happy to eat like a beautiful, healthy meal that had you know, lots of nutritious, um, you know, elements to it. And it it was just, was just this dream come true. And so I started using that with several of my physician clients and they found that especially once they got used to it and their bodies got used to it, it was amazing. Like I had a client who was a surgeon and she was like, listen, like I have to eat a snack before I go into surgery, like even in the middle of the night, because otherwise I'm going to feel like I don't have energy. And what ended up happening when she, she, you know, of course, like challenged her mindset around this and what her beliefs were about it was that she actually felt better and felt like she could operate better when she hadn't eaten the snack because Hmm. she stopped believing like, oh, I need some fuel. I need some, some actual, um, you know, glucose in my system to be able to operate well. I have worked with anesthesiologists who, you know, it's, it seems like, oh, that's like such a great lifestyle, but they start super early in the day. And if they're in a busy uh, medical center, they are going nonstop like the whole day and they can't even have water with them in the operating room. Like they never know when they're going to be able to eat. And what they would do so often, what they would tell me they would do is like, if they did get a moment to eat, it was just whatever happened to be in the doctor's lounge, you know, muffins, donuts, whatever, just like shove something that goes down fast in your mouth and then move on. And what they found is if they could just fast throughout the day and then eat, like I said, like it's, this isn't like cover up for an eating disorder where you don't eat, you eat when you do eat, you eat a beautiful, you know, nice, satisfying, filling meal. Like it it just made their day so much less stressful. They didn't have to worry about finding time to eat. Like they, they just felt like their whole experience of their day was so much better. So it really has been this thing that I never really expected to become such a big part of what I advocate, but it, it, and I have to say it's not for everybody, but it is for people who are willing to give it a try. So many of them find it to be just such a nice option. It doesn't mean you never eat. It just means that if you can't eat or you decide not to, for whatever reason, you feel amazing. It's not a hardship. Yeah, I really like that idea that we kind of, you know, that, that feeling of being hangry or that idea that we can't go for a while without food seems so silly on, on certain yes, levels, you know, right, right. And like I, I, I can picture myself. I know myself in those moments where I just feel like if I don't eat right now, like I'm going to be difficult to be around. Yes. And so like, let's get to the specifics here of, of what exactly the fasting protocol kind of looks like for those who are picturing this, because obviously in my mind, they're thinking, well, wait a minute, if I'm not going to eat for, I don't know, 16 hours a day or something, mm-hmm. won't that be a difficult transition and won't I be hungry? Like, how does it, what does it yeah. look like to do the system? Here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what I find is that, I mean, first of all, there's no like hard and fast rules about like the right way to do this and the wrong way to do this. So that's an important thing to remember. And here's the other thing to remember too, is if at any time you feel bad, like it's not working well for you, you eat. (laughs) Mm. It's as simple, right? That we're not about completely punishing ourselves or feeling like total crap or anything like that. Um, If you really need to, you eat. But this is the way I take my clients through it because I find that when you go through this process um, in this way, it's the smoothest, it's the easiest, and it's the most comfortable slash least uncomfortable um, in, in getting to that process. So the first thing I ask my clients to do is to take a break from eating sugar and flour on a regular basis. So that means that it doesn't mean that you're eating super low carb, like you could totally eat whole grains, you can have starchy veggies, you can eat fruit, like you're definitely eating carbs if you decide you want to. I mean, some people choose to eat low carb because they just feel better when they eat that way. And that's fine. But you are just not eating things that are ground up into a flour or things that have added sugar. The great thing about this, especially with us being in the pandemic and people not eating out so much and everything is if we're cooking at home more, this is 
easier than ever. Like the simpler the the meals, the better. And so what people find is like, this is actually not that hard once you start just figuring out like, what are the meals that I already like that don't have sugar and flour in them? Um, or, you know, if I just prepare things from scratch and don't use pre-prepared things or sauces from the grocery store, there's actually not sugar in these anyway. And so you can eat really, really beautiful meals that are very simple, very easy without that don't have any flour sugar and it. it's not a problem. So we do that usually for four to six weeks to let the body just adjust to accessing your fat stores. Um, I don't ask people to fast during this time. In fact, I usually tell them like, you can eat as often as you need to. If you're really feeling like you need food, then you just go ahead and eat. It's not a problem at all. But what you find over the course of time is that the ability to fast very gradually just starts to develop on its own. So what I mean by that is that, you know, maybe the first week, maybe second week, you're, you're eating a little bit more often or making sure you're having snacks. And then you find you're like, you know what? I just, you know, ate breakfast and like, I seriously did not feel hungry at all until three in the afternoon. Like, that's interesting. That doesn't usually happen, you know, or like I woke up, I wasn't hungry or I was really, really busy, rushed out of the house, got to work. And I just realized, you know, I I wasn't even hungry until 11. So I just decided to wait and eat lunch. And so your body just very naturally on its own when you're not consuming flour and sugar on a regular basis it, it just develops this ability to very easily access your fat stores for energy rather than making you feel like crap so that you eat something that contains usually something that has like some, you know, simple carb in it so that it can, doesn't have to do the hard work of converting your fat to energy, right? It's just like, I'm just going to make you feel terrible. And then you <laughs> go ahead and eat. This is how we do things. And right, we're like, yes, absolutely. Where's the snack? I'll eat it. And, um, and, and so we just have to remind the body. It's not like the body forgets how to do this. It, we just have to remind it that it totally can do this and this isn't a big deal. So then once you get to that place where you're already starting to notice, you're like, wow, my energy levels are so much more even. A lot of people say they sleep better. They just feel like even often that their mood is just a lot more even. Then they start, you know, what I encourage them to do is to start experimenting a little bit with uh, a little bit more fasting. Now, here's where you have to just be really careful because first of all, I just want to mention anybody who has a history of an eating disorder in the past needs to be very, very careful with intermittent fasting because some, for some people, especially people who have a history of anorexia in their past, like some people will find that when they don't eat, they actually get like a big dopamine hit. Like hmm. people who have that history. And so it's, it's, like, it's like a high for them to not eat. And that's, we want to be real careful about that, right? Like, cause like I said, like, this is not an eating disorder. Like you, you do eat, you're just eating all of your food over a shorter period of time throughout the day, rather than spreading it out throughout the day. And the other thing I'll mention is people who have history of binging or binge eating disorder will sometimes find that they can go all day long, not eating. And they'll say, Oh, fasting is amazing. I don't, I don't have any trouble binging when I'm fasting. But then what they'll find is when they do eat, they will binge or they'll just eat and eat and eat. And this sometimes looks like eating a full meal that should be enough and then actually feeling hungrier after the meal is over than when you started. Like that doesn't, you know, you think about it, like typically that's not how our satiety cues work, right? Like we feel hungry, we eat, and then we should feel more satisfied. If you're starting to feel like you're more hungry, then we have to start looking like, okay, maybe we need to work on the binge eating first and, um, and not go super long with, um, with any kind of uh, fasting that we do. So, so some people think that fasting for 16 hours and eating over an eight hour window is best. Some people like to tighten that window up and eat over a six hour window. Some people will do longer fasts. You'll hear people who are doing like couple day fasts. What I would say is that you don't need to do anything like on the more extreme end, meaning eating once a day or less often to still get a ton of benefits out of intermittent fasting. If it's something you want to experiment with, I would just say really just educate yourself and make sure you know what the warning signs are for this turning into kind of an obsession. Some people find that that they really feel amazing and like to do it for health reasons. And here's the thing, fasting is a part of most major religions. Like it's not like a new concept. (laughs) Like people have been fasting for like a really long time for lots of different reasons. So, so we know that this isn't something that, that has to be a problem. Um, It's just, we're using it for a different purpose. So what I usually recommend that people do is that they start, if they've been eating like three meals a day and they want to experiment with intermittent fasting, then maybe start pushing your breakfast to just a little bit later in the morning and, um, and then see how you do with lunch. Make sure you don't overeat at lunch. And then over the course of 
time, you might find that you can actually con combine your breakfast and your lunch together. So maybe you're eating kind of an early lunch, maybe around 10.30 or 11. And then you can see if you can push that back to normal lunch time. And then before you know it, you're eating two meals a day, right? You're eating lunch and dinner. And what that allows your body to do is several things. First of all, it allows your body to access your fat stores for energy more, which if you're looking to lose weight or, you know, just for weight maintenance can be really, really great. But it also helps to keep your insulin levels lower. And so one of the main reasons that a lot of us struggle with being overweight or, um, you know, having prediabetes or type 2 diabetes is because of insulin resistance, which means that our cells are not as sensitive to insulin's effects as they should be. And so what insulin does is it helps the glucose in your bloodstream, like the food that's been broken down that you've eaten to enter into your cells and to be stored for energy for later. And so if you are more insulin resistant, what that means is that your pancreas has to send out even more insulin and more insulin and more insulin to get the cells to respond the way they should. And that is highly correlated with weight gain. So what we want to do is get our bodies more insulin sensitive. The way to do that is to keep our insulin levels low. And the way to do that is to take breaks from eating, which is what intermittent fasting is. I like it. Um, I, I've heard a lot of plans that are, I guess, for the most part with intermittent fasting, like a 16 8 plan. So you have yeah. you know, eight mm -hmm. hours of eating, 16 hours off. Um, yeah. Is that basically kind of a goal to shoot for? Or, I mean, you mentioned this idea of like multi day fasting, that sort of thing. Like, for those who want to push the envelope here, what's the, what's the goal we're kind of shooting for to have like a sustainable system here? Yeah, I think 168 is is a great sustainable system. And just for anybody who's new to this, this like your sleep time is combined into that 16 hours, okay? Yeah. So like what <laughs> cuz that sounds like a lot, right? Until you realize like, "Oh, I fast every night when I sleep," right? Like we we sometimes forget that. So so what that usually means is that you eat your dinner and then you don't eat again until the following late morning or you know, lunchtime, um, kind of depends on what your schedule is. So you, so you, the 16 hour starts when you finish dinner and then it goes until, you know, until the time, um, is up and then you eat your next meal. And so like, what I always like to remind people is like, what you're doing is you're eating all of your food for the whole day, just over that shorter time period. Now, some people will say, well, then I was grazing for eight hours. We don't really want to graze for eight hours. I would suggest <laughs> that if you're, if your eating window is eight hours, then you, then you have two meals in there. If you really feel like you can't go, um, you know, the, um, the full time in between those meals, then you could plan for like a, a small snack in there. Um, if you're really feeling like you need that food, that would be fine. But what also can be helpful when you're fasting is having a little bit of straight fat. You can have a little piece of avocado. Um, like you're trying to just consume some straight fat and that actually will make you feel um, satisfied for a long time. It's really kind of, it's one of those things I always think of it as like an experiment when I'm trying things, you know, before I tell people about it. And it's, it's kind of uncanny how long that little bit of fat can, can tide you over. And it depends what your goals are too. I want to be clear on that. You know, for some people, they're really looking to lose a bunch of weight and they really do want to, um, you know, give the, their bodies a break to utilize the energy that they've consumed after the first meal, before the second meal. Other people are like, listen, my weight's great. And, you know, I'm totally able to maintain just fine. I'm doing this for other health reasons. Um, there's there's a lot of data that, that shows that when you give your body a break from digesting food, it actually has more kind of like time and energy to go through your body and pick off all like the dead and maybe precancerous cells that you have, um, that it just is very helpful for kind of pruning, you know, like mm. just keeping you um, more healthy. And so what that requires you to do then is to have periods of time where you're not eating. So it depends what your goals are. And like I said, the, the extended fasting stuff, like, I, you know, just with a lot of experience for years now, I've been taking clients through this and, and I've done some longer fast myself again, just to see what's involved so that I could um, give some, you know, reasonable advice about it. And what I found is that it's, it really is, it is often, especially for people who want to lose weight, it's often diet mentality driven, um, meaning that, you know, if you don't eat for four days or something, like you can expect to lose a, a reasonable amount of weight. But what ends up happening is for a lot of people, because they haven't eaten in so long, is that when they do eat, they have a couple of days of overeating to compensate for the eating they didn't do. 
right? And then they end up gaining back a lot of the weight that they lost. So I usually discourage people from doing that uh, just because I just don't think it's necessary. But again, like, you know, for some people, they might say like, listen, like I have, you know, a big history of dementia in my family or a strong cancer history in my family. And I really want to do things that I mean, anything that I can to try to prevent that. Well, then that would be a different motivation. And you'd be, you know, I would always recommend people plan their food for when they break their fast so that they're not just like kind of, you know, getting into that sort of overeating binge mentality um, and and plan it out, right? That's not something that you do every week. That's something that maybe you do once a year, twice a year, you know, probably maximum once a quarter or something like that. So during the time when you're fasting, are you are you going to consume anything else like coffee, water, or supplements, anything like that? Yeah, or is it really just nothing during that time frame? Yeah, well, so so a lot of people who do religious fasts will do it with not even having water. I 100% do not encourage you to do it that way. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you aren't even consuming any fluid, it's going to feel a lot less comfortable for you, for <laughs> sure. So I recommend, you know, tons and tons of water. Um, you've got to keep yourself hydrated. Because of course, when you're dehydrated, you don't feel well. And so it's, you know, just to flush everything out. I just think of it as like, if your body is breaking down your fat stores, like we call that dining in, you know, it's like, instead of dining (laughs) out, like you're dining in on your fat stores. Like, you know, you have to think like, okay, you need to flush out, like, just what's what's happened in the process of converting that fat to um, to energy that your cells can use. So I recommend tons and tons of water. Um, or what I often recommend to my clients is like, well, before you have your first cup of coffee, you need to drink at least 20 ounces of water. And then after your first cup, if you want a second one, then maybe make a rule for yourself. Okay, well, once I finish another 20 ounces of water, then I can have that second cup of coffee, because we often will feel hunger when it's actually thirst. Mm. And, um, and so we want to just make sure that we're giving the body what it really needs. So let's imagine that somebody gets on the system, they're doing fasting for a while. How soon can they expect to see, I guess, health benefits? Like, and you mentioned this idea, like more mental clarity, possibly weight loss. Like, is there a certain amount of time you should fast to get these kinds of benefits or are these things happening sooner in the process? You know, it really, really depends on the person's body. And so I recommend that you are really, really patient with yourself because you know how we are, right? We're like, well, it's been three days. Why haven't I lost 15 pounds? I mean, (laughs) come on, you know, like, (laughs) right, we get we get all impatient and we want to see results yesterday. And so so for some people, remember, I talked about insulin resistance. If you are somebody who is already a little bit or a lot insulin resistant, it might take a number of weeks before you start seeing any results. Um, So you just have to be patient through that time. Time. Like, and I'm talking like, you know, it could be six to eight weeks even before you start seeing anything. Like you're like, okay, I'm doing all this fasting, nothing's happening. But I've I've seen this time and again where people are sticking with it and then all of a sudden their body's like, oh, you know what? It's safe. I can actually release some of this excess fat that I have. Like you just have to stick with it. Then other people, the first week, it's like boom, the weight starts falling off. So it really just depends on how insulin sensitive or resistant you are. Now, you know, having like working with doctors, um, you know, everybody then is interested in like, well, should I get a blood test? Like, should I can find out like how insulin resistant I am? I always discourage them from doing that because it really doesn't matter. Like whatever number you get or like whatever figure you get, like it's just something to manage your brain around. I just look at it like if you're, especially if you're looking to lose weight, you could just assume that you have some uh, element of insulin resistance going on. And the way to deal with that is to become more insulin sensitive. And so that is not eating foods that make your insulin spike, such as sugar and flour um, on a regular basis and getting your body so that it's truly fat adapted so that you can go, you know, lengthy periods of time without eating. And it's just more than happy to go tap into your excess fat stores for energy and it doesn't make you, you know, feel like you want to die because you haven't eaten. So I'm thinking here in terms of the food that we're going to eat when we're eating. Uh, yeah. If you go for 16 hours without food, let's say, yes. and then you're going to consume all your calories and just, you know, a, a smaller chunk of time. Are there like, is it more like calorie dense meals or is the total calories for the day going to be lower because you're eating in a shorter time frame? Or is what should we shoot for in terms of yeah. consumption when we're eating? Yeah. Well, so I don't really like to talk about like calorie counts or even like macronutrients or things like that. I think 
that, you know, especially those of us who are interested in nutrition, it's like, we don't need to see a calorie count to know that, you know, like a ding dong or a ho ho or whatever is like, <laughs> probably not the best. But also like, you know, calories doesn't doesn't really, you know, it's just a unit of energy, it really doesn't tell us the quality of that food. So, you know, again, like if you're eating some avocado, you might be like, Oh, my gosh, that's so high calorie. But then you eat some like, you know, fat free, sugar free, whatever, you know, garbage kind of food that that really doesn't serve your body. You know, it's lower calorie, but but that that doesn't talk about the quality of the food. What I suggest when you're eating one of those meals, well, first of all, when you haven't eaten in 16 hours, the food tastes amazing. Even healthy food <laughs> tastes so good. I mean, I remember just being like, oh my gosh, this carrot, it tastes so delicious. Like it's, it's great, right? Because when we're eating a bunch of junk all the time, often healthy food doesn't even taste that good anymore. Um, to us. So, um, so I recommend, of course, like eating a variety of vegetables, um, having some good solid protein, and then having, um, you know, making sure you're getting some good healthy fat in there as well, because that's also going to help you with that satiety. So it's a different, what I find with this kind of eating is it's a different kind of satiety than just like a fullness. Like back in my days, when I did Weight Watchers, they would say like, well, you know, um, you can have as many vegetables as you want, like that's all quote, unquote, free, right? Like, you don't have to count points for that. And so what I would do because I would be afraid of being hungry later and not having any more points left, I would eat like these massive salads and I would feel really, really full, but not necessarily like satisfied, like that nice kind of settled, satisfied feeling. And you know what helps you to achieve that feeling is fat. So, um, so what you're doing is you're more paying attention to your hunger signals and stopping right when you get to that place of your, of your belly feeling really nicely satisfied, like you've had enough and not getting to that place of being overly full. Like I like to say that like you want to get to the place where like you could definitely go for a walk around the block. You know, it's been too much if you kind of are like, mm, you know, I always think of like when you're leaning back a little, you know, like trying to stretch out, like, <laughs> like trying to get a little space in there, you know, or like if you're like, uh, I don't want to go for a walk right now, like give me an hour to digest. Like that was probably a little too much, you know, so you can start really tapping into what does a true satisfied feeling feel to me? What does it feel like in my body and experimenting with knowing how much food that is and experimenting with not eating so fast that you don't have that, you know, that that signal coming through to you, right? Like taking your time, pacing yourself, and, um, and then checking in, like, where am I? Like, have I had enough? Or do I need a little more? Like, what's actually happening there? And using that as a gauge versus counting calories or counting macros. You know, the other thing I was thinking of while you're mentioning this idea of being hungry is that the time of the day that I'm usually the most hungry is after a workout. How does fasting play into exercise? Because I know that one of the things that I tend to do is the more I work out, the more calories I want to consume. And I want to do that usually all the time. So yes. like, how does that play into someone who wants to be physically fit and kind of maintain a diet that looks like what you're describing here uh, without finding yourself just like dying for food and then right. saying, well, I'm in the time frame I can't eat. So I'm, I'm stuck here. Like, what do you do right. then? Right. Well, here's the thing is actually exercise exercising while fasted is is really, really good for your body. Mm. Um, so it's it's actually something that your body can get used to doing where you actually feel amazing. And you feel great afterward. And that hunger like that hunger is probably coming mostly because your body's just used to consuming, you know, the you consuming um, energy, right, like eating some food uh, after you exercise or around that same time of day. So, uh, so it's something that you can, your body can definitely get used to doing. I would say though, that like, if you're, you know, doing really, really intense workouts, lifting really super heavy weights, um, you know, running really, you know, like marathon training or something, um, you're going to have to play around with this a little bit, right? Like maybe you'll be like, if you do, you know, your long run or something first thing in the morning, then maybe you do your eight hour eating window earlier in the day. Like there's some people who just eat breakfast and lunch, and then they don't eat dinner, right? Right? Like there's different ways to play around with it. So what I would say is that you just need to listen to your body. And um, first of all, just um, question the belief that you have that you have to eat afterward. I mean, for sure you want to hydrate, right? Um, and it depends what your goals are, right? Like if you're trying to put on like 20 pounds of muscle, yeah, you probably do need to eat after, you know, <laughs> right? It really just depends like what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but, but if you have this belief, like I have to eat after I work out, then of course that's going to be your experience of it. But you can question that belief and go like, what if I could feel amazing after I work out and still eat at the normally scheduled time when I normally want to, like 
what might that look like and how could I maybe support myself? And you start looking for solutions to create, you know, that option. So, I mean, I have done like intense 90 minute orange theory workouts and fasted. So I haven't eaten before, don't eat afterward. And I feel completely great, like great energy, totally able to do the workout. It's just, you know, helping your body to remember how to do that. I'd like to think of it this way, you know, when think about like, you know, several hundred or thousands of years ago, like if you, you know, didn't have food, <laughs> right? And you had to like go out and hunt and kill something or find find a root or a berry bush or something like that. Like you might go days and days without being able to kill something, right? Or being able to find something if food was scarce. Like it would not make sense that you would, you know, walk many, many miles, right? Like go all over the place looking to find food, not be able to find any and then feel like really terrible after. Like if anything, you would want to feel more energized so that you could really get out there and find some food. And that's exactly what you find happens to you as you fast for longer. It's the opposite of what you think, but your body has to be ready to do it. And, and I really, truly do recommend, um, you know, taking that break from sugar and flour to get your body used to it. I'm not saying you can't ever eat it again. I'm just saying like when you're, when you're going into the process of experimenting with fasting, it really is so much easier to do it when you're not consuming sugar and flour regularly. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, another thing I'm thinking here is that I know that when these when people like start a new kind of, of dietary regimen, that it's very common to just to quit. And so I'm wondering, mm-hmm. like, what are the common pitfalls or reasons why someone would give up fasting? Is it just simply like not enough discipline over time to you know, they want to eat more often? Or like, why would some or what are those common things people are going to experience that we could kind of almost like, you know, preempt and, and avoid you know, on, yeah. the, on the front end? Yeah. Well, I think what happens sometimes is, you know, people will say like, well, during the week, it's not a problem for me to fast through breakfast. But then on the weekend, I really want to be able to go out for brunch or, you know, have breakfast with my family or, you know, kind of like loosen the reins a little. Um, Again, it depends on what your goals are. If you're just doing this to, you know, just support your body and your weight is stable and you feel good when you have, um, you know, breakfast on the weekends, like that's totally fine. You don't have to fast the same way every single day. I mean, you literally could, I mean, there's some people who promote just eating, um, you know, a couple times a week eating, um, you know, smaller amounts and the benefits of doing that. So, so you just, I think whenever people are believing that like, there's rules and then they're breaking the rules, then they're much less likely to be consistent with something versus looking at it like this is a tool I can use that I, I use to my own benefit, right? Like, mm. so what do I want to do? And how can I make it work for me in a way that's sustainable? Like maybe you just are like, hey, just once or twice a week, I want to fast to start like I'm not even going to do it every single day. And then I'm going to just get more used to it, get my body more used to it. And then maybe I'll do it three or four times a week. Um, I think, like I said, the, the other pitfalls to just watch for are to just start being like, oh my gosh, like, I'm just really not that hungry anymore. Like, maybe I'll just never eat again. And, you know, we <laughs> kind of joke about that. But like, some people are like, well, I just wasn't hungry. And I didn't want to eat if I wasn't hungry. And now it's been, you know, a day and a half, and I haven't eaten. I'm like, okay, but hold on a second. Like, this is when we have to use our brains to, mm. to kind of tell us like, okay, well, you know, we do need to eat on occasion, right? Like, we probably <laughs> want to be planning on eating something. We just want to be really aware of diet mentality mentality thoughts, um, you know, kind of creeping up or starting to, to take it kind of to those extremes. Um, I think it really helps if you know what your goals are and you can already define for yourself, like, how will I know that I'm successful in doing this? Like, this is how I define success. So it's not like, oh, well, you know, I'm doing this every single day, but I haven't lost enough weight. So maybe I need to start doing, you know, like a day and a half fast, you know, once or twice a week and see if I can lose some more weight and, you know, like it, like letting it bleed into kind of excess. Um, Other than that, I think, you know, as long as you plan your food, I think that that can be really um, helpful if you have any trouble, like when you break your fast wanting to eat all the things, like some people will be like, well, I'm, I'm, you know, ready to eat and I'm hungry and I'm preparing my meal. And so I eat like another half of a meal in snacks as I'm preparing the meal. You know, we've all done that, right? It's mm-hmm. like, you know, some, some for the recipe, some for me, you know, like we're kind of eating those things. And that I think is, is totally normal. But just, you know, recognizing like, okay, I can do that. And I can eat all these things while I'm, you know, cooking the food and then eat, 
half as much food afterward, but I probably can't eat a whole meal afterward and still expect to see um, the results that, you know, that I'm wanting. I like expect myself to want to stop after only eating a little bit. Um, So I think just planning it out, just going like, I'm going to have this and not like measuring it out like cups or, you know, weights or things like that necessarily, but just saying like, okay, I'm going to have this food and I'm going to wait until it's on a plate and I'm seated to eat it. Like you can kind of create some guidelines for yourself Um, that can help to, um, to prevent that. Um, as well. And and just making sure that you're not doing the, like I said, like kind of binging in between. And you know, when I say binging, like some people are truly binging, like the medical definition of it, and some people are just overeating. But regardless, you know, you don't want to get into that frenzy of like, well, I couldn't have the food before. Now I can, I, this is my chance, I have to eat all <laughs> yeah. of the things, right? Like that is, that's a problem. We want to make sure that, you know, like anytime I have a client who does that, I'm like, okay, we're not fasting anymore, at least for a considerable amount of time, three meals a day. Like we have to remind the body and the brain, there's plenty of food. We are not in a famine. <laughs> like we, you know, like, <laughs> right? Like, like there's, there's lots of food available so that we don't get into that massive scarcity. Does this work well with travel as well? Are there any uh, issues in terms of wanting to fast when you're not in your own regimen or in your own system? Because one thing I know that I tend to change what I eat when I'm not at home. And I want, uh, is there any like challenge or this extra that's difficult in that sense of when you're not in your house? Like, how do you manage that flow? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I actually think that fasting is an amazing tool to use when you're traveling. Cause what do we often do when we travel is we overeat, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're in the airport or whatever and getting our snacks or, you know, oftentimes like our schedule's out of whack because we got up super early or we're staying up really a lot later than usual or, you know, we're just, we're just out of our normal routine. And so what can be really nice about fasting when you're traveling is that you don't have to contemplate whether you're going to have like the warm nuts on the airplane, right? <laughs> it's just a no, you know, like I'm just not having that. Like you're not having to make a lot of decisions when you're already in a kind of an environment where you're a little bit compromised in terms of your decision making abilities, you know, where it's already a little bit more stressful or, um, or things like that. So, um, so I think fasting can be super, super great and so convenient, right? Like your, your flight, like say you have a connecting flight and, um, and you know, it, your first plane is late and you thought you'd have time to grab something on your layover to eat and you end up just running to the next plane and getting on like you don't have to buy whatever you know junky snacks they have on the airplane like you literally can just be like oh it's cool I'll just fast through and feel great about it right like not feel like you're you know really having a, <laughs> a problem. So I think it's a, it's a great tool to use. The other thing that some people will use sometimes is, um, like say you, you know, you, you were traveling and you had like this amazing meal, you know, you're on vacation or something and you ate this like big dinner and you know that you overate, you know, like the next morning, like what sometimes I'll do is I'll just say, like, I'm not like punishing myself for eating more food, but I'll just say, you know, what, I'm not going to eat today until I get legitimately hungry. Mm. And I let my body determine when that is. Because if I've eaten extra food the night before and my body is functioning appropriately, it should know that the next day I don't need quite as much. And so that might look like, you know, not having breakfast, but maybe also not really having lunch or just having like a really small lunch or a really late lunch. Um, and just letting my body dictate that. But when you're thinking that you need to eat by the clock, then you're less likely to allow your body to do that. So I think it's a great way to kind of manage um, or prevent the weight gain that often comes with travel as well. Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, traveling definitely has that, that weight gain effect. Um, For a lot of people, yeah. You, you mentioned this idea of, of waiting until you're hungry. And I'm curious because I know one thing that I have done in the past is like I'll wait until my stomach is like phys- like audibly grumbling. Yes. Like, is that too far? Or like what kind of like, you know, physiological signs are we looking for here to know that like, oh, okay, now's the time to eat versus, you know, now's the time to like push through and wait a few more hours? Yeah, that's such a good question. And here's the thing. It's different for everybody. Like I rarely have the grumbling stomach. Whereas I hear from other people, like people I work with that, like many of them totally know, like their signal that it's time to eat is the grumbling stomach. But if I waited for that, I, 
you know, very rarely <laughs> would be eating anything because it's just not how my body um, gives me that signal. The thing that is also important to understand is the difference between emotional hunger and true physical hunger. Mm. And so, um, so for everybody, it's a little different. I'll explain to you what it's like for me and how I can tell the difference for myself. But, you know, it's really easy for us emotionally to convince ourselves that we need to eat when probably physically we're okay. And, um, and so like for me with emotional hunger, it comes on very quick and strong. Whereas physical hunger is going to come on much more gradually. Like it's, you know, like you start getting a little hungry and then you're a little hungrier and you're a little hungrier. Whereas with emotional hunger, it's like all of a sudden I feel like I'm starving. It's like, boom, <laughs> like so hungry. Right. And like really hungry. Um, sometimes it'll happen after I've had like a totally satisfying dinner, you know, an hour later, like, well, that's weird. Why do I feel so hungry after I just ate a meal an hour ago? Like, you know, when your brain's like, that doesn't make sense. Maybe it doesn't make sense. Right. Like actually thinking about that. And then, um, and then what I find is that it also will go away very quickly as well. So if I don't actually eat in response to that hunger and I just stay patient with myself, then I'll find, you know, sometimes five, 10 minutes later, it's like, boom, it's gone. Whereas true physical hunger isn't going to go away typically that fast. Like it'll kind of come on with a gradual um, onset and it will go away more gradually as well, even if you don't eat. Right. So like we were talking about with the, um, with fasting, right? It's not like you never feel hungrier. It just comes on. It's not like a wave crashing over you. It's much more like a little wave, like lapping at your ankles, right? It's kind of like, oh, we, you know, we could eat right now. Oh, you're not going to eat. Okay. That's cool. All right. That's good. You know, so it's like maybe, you know, 15, 20 minutes, but just kind of gradually tapers off and goes away again. So knowing that difference is important. A lot of people find that emotional hunger doesn't actually um, feel, it's not, they don't feel it over their actual stomach. They, a lot of people feel it like in their chest or their throat. Hmm. So if you spend a little time actually getting out of your head and, and embodying your body, right? Like where in my body do I feel this right now? You might find like, oh, you know what? When I feel that hunger, but it's like up high, that's actually not true physical hunger. So getting really clear on that can, can really, really help you when you're like, I don't know, like, am I hungry? Do I need to eat? Do I not? You know, <laughs> but like I said, if you really are like feeling bad, you're like, I feel like I'm going to faint or, you know, something like that you eat, right? Like when you're fasting, like the, the answer is never like, well, you just have to suffer and, you know, wait until it's your, your eating window is, is started. No, if you're feeling bad, you eat. But when you do it properly, what you find is that that doesn't happen. Right. Like hmm. it's I think that's more of our fear that we're going to feel bad. But when we say to ourselves, well, OK, if I feel really bad, I'll eat. And then we find, oh, actually, it turns out I don't feel really that bad. I feel great, in fact. So if you get to a point where you're feeling hangry or you're feeling like, you know, not eating is causing like distress, is that just a sign that you have been addicted to sugar or is that a sign that you're not like properly like filled with the right nutrients? Like what does that mean if you, I guess, get to that emotional like you know, panic moment, I guess, yeah, in yeah. terms of, of hunger? That really is going to be more of being like a sugar burner, like we talked about, which okay. is, is just your body not really being very willing to go access your fat stores for energy, right? Like it can do it. It's just as like, I don't want to. It's kind of like, you know, a little toddler rebelling, right? It's like, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to, right? And so it just, you know, lets you know by making you feel really crummy. So what I would say is if that happens, it's okay. You just eat. That's fine. But then you just know that there's more fat adaptation to, to happen, you know, for your body to come. Like you're still working on getting your body adapted to that. And I would just double down on taking a break from the um, flour and sugar to get your body to that place. So as your body becomes more fat adapted, does that mean that your body is actually like lowering your BMI? Like are your, is your, your fat, like content in your body being reduced because your body's eating your own fat? Well, it, it depends, right? Because you can be fat adapted and still eat too much food, right? Okay. So like if that happens, then, then, you know, you can still overeat. And so you won't necessarily lower your BMI or, or something like that. But what it basically means is, um, is if, if you're fat adapted, your body will give you the signal, like the, the message, like, hey, you know, it's, it's time for some energy, we could use some. But if you don't eat, for whatever reason, right, because you choose not to, or you're busy or whatever, it's not a good time, then what you do is what it does is it just happily goes and access your accesses your fat stores for energy, which when you think about it, like that's the whole point of having fat anyway. Mm, like, why do we have yeah. fat on our bodies, right? It's so that we can survive the winter when there's no food. And so even when you're at a normal, healthy weight, normal BMI, you have, uh, on average, you're going to have about a month's worth of meals on your body in the form of fat. Hmm. 
Wow. So like even if you're yeah, so even if you are like at a totally normal weight, like you can you can skip a meal, you can miss a meal, you're going to be okay, right? Which is the opposite of what all the messaging is that we get, right? Like why do we have a snack food industry? Well, because the food manufacturers realized that they couldn't get us to eat more food at meal times. So they created <laughs> other opportunities, and I'm not kidding, like this is the truth. They created other opportunities for us to eat, and so then the message has been like you need to have snacks. Like I don't know how old you are. I'm 44. I did not grow up eating snacks. Like snacking was not a thing. Huh. And now it's like everything, like everywhere you go, like everywhere there's food everywhere, you need yeah. snacks, like kids are snacking constantly. And it's really, it's just been created by the, by the food industry going like, well, hey, this is a way we can get people to buy more food and spend more money. And so, um, so when you're aware of that, it's like, you know, our bodies really don't need that to function. We really can go a long time without eating. And not only can we do it, it's actually normal and it's actually pretty good for us. I want to see like an intermittent fasting vending machine, you know, and one, one full of nothing. It's like, <laughs> right. Eat all this. It's empty. <laughs> exactly. This is what you need to eat. It's a whole big fat zero. Nothing. <laughs> That's funny. Um, did I did I miss anything today in terms of what else we should learn about this? I feel like you covered a lot, but I know you have a lot more resources also for listeners to learn from. So anything else you want to mention uh, today? Yeah, I mean, I just think that this is something that, you know, I just want to make sure that whoever's listening, you know, don't make sure you're managing your mind around this. Like I see a lot of people getting like worried or stressed or like, you know, really confused. Like this is just a tool that you can use like anything else. And um, you don't have to do it to have success. It's just really nice, especially if you have kind of that lifestyle where, you know, things are unpredictable or, you know, you just kind of, um, you know, like feel like you're, you're um, constantly thinking about food, like it's really nice to have a break, you know, like I don't have to think about eating anything today if I'm fasting, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> like this, I could just like get to work and be more productive or, you know, things like that. Um, but if it's something that is um, like stressing you out, or you're feeling like um, it's, it's causing problems for you, then then you just don't do it. It's okay. Like I said, it's not for everybody. I think it's easy for us to get on the bandwagon of like, this is the latest thing. And this is what everyone needs to be doing. And, and that's just, you know, there's not one size fits all for anything, right? Right? There's not one way of eating that's going to work for every single person. Well, I love the idea that it's a tool. You know, it's, it's one of your options. I feel like that's exactly. a yeah, that's a handy way to think of it as opposed to like I said before this kind of extremist perspective with rules. And if you break them, then you you know, you fail for the day. That, that sort of thing, which obviously yes. leads yes. to that diet cycle that's not healthy. Yes. So exactly, exactly. And here's what's interesting is if you if you just look at some people who are naturally thin people, they often will tell you that they prefer to just work through lunch. You know, like they, yeah. they just sort of on their own have figured this out. Um, I've actually known several doctors who do that. They're like, no, I'd rather just see patients through lunch. Like, it's not a big deal. I just, you know, have my water or whatever, and I just work through lunch. Well, it's interesting, right? They don't have a weight problem. So mm. they're, they're doing it for different reasons, right? Like they're like, I feel fine and I can see more people and whatever, you know, like that's, they're not doing it to, in order to lose weight or maintain their weight, but that's an added side effect of it. Or if you've ever heard of people who are like, oh, I just forgot to eat. Right. Like when I struggled with my weight, I'm like, what do you mean you forgot to eat? What is that? So like, <laughs> like I've forgotten a meal a day in my life. Right. You know, <laughs> but but it's like, you know, that's what happens when your body is happy to just access its fat stores. Right. You literally aren't thinking about eating. So. So that, those are kind of the benefits. Like, you know, again, when people start going like, I don't know, and I think this can be overdone. I think, it, you know, um, it, it could be a problem. Like, I totally agree. It really can be a problem if you're not really careful about it. You just need to be you just need to be um, thoughtful with why you're doing it, what the purpose of it is, and what the results are for you. Like I said, I can't even tell you how many doctors are like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Because <laughs> I used to, you know, eat all this food, feeling so sorry for myself that I hadn't had time to, you know, have lunch or whatever. And now they just, that's wiped that all away because they're just like, yeah, it's no big deal. I'll just fast through lunch and I get to have even more dinner. Awesome. You know, like they just don't even care. Well, I also feel like you might be able to avoid that afternoon slump that people tend to have because sure. you know, you've eaten a, a big meal yes. at lunch and then you feel this like afternoon, just like, I want to take a nap now. I mean, yes. you might be able just to avoid that feeling altogether. I mean, it sounds great. Yes. yes. I mean, the reason why you feel that tiredness is because the insulin surge that comes from eating the food. So when you're eating, like you may have noticed if you eat something that's like, you know, more sugary or like really carb heavy, you know, people will talk about like, you know, food coma or whatever, right? Like feeling like more tired afterwards, it's because you have more of an insulin surge. So again, with fasting, what we're doing is we're keeping that insulin level lower 
And, um, and that in turn, you know, gives us more energy. So it's actually really nice. Like I, I've had times where I have not, I have eaten lunch and then I'm trying to work and I'm like, Oh shoot. Like I'm feeling kind of tired now. Like you get almost <laughs> used to that energy that you usually have in the afternoon and you're like, Oh, bummer. You know? <laughs> yeah. Very true. Well, this, this has been fantastic. I feel like I have learned a lot. I'm definitely inspired to wanted to go dig in this more. And there's a lot here to learn. So where can our listeners learn more from you about this topic and everything else you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I have a, a really great guide that can be helpful for anybody, whether you're a doctor or not. It's called Six Steps to Jumpstart Your Weight Loss, especially with what's been going on in 2020 with, you know, so many people gaining weight and feeling, um, you know, just <laughs> really kind of discouraged with, you know, their, their, um, you know, health and, and well-being and that kind of thing. Um, I just look at it like, you know, we don't have to do all the things all at once, but we can probably pick one step and start applying that regularly. And, you know, maybe when that step is kind of incorporated into what we're doing regularly, then we can pick a second step, like kind of gradually get ourselves back on track. So best way to get that is to go to katrinaubellmd.com forward slash six, S-I-X. Okay, perfect. I'll have that link in the show notes page this week. Uh, that's awesome. awesome. Good to have a free guide there. But uh, this has been great. I, I'm really, yeah, I really am inspired to try this out. I think there's a lot of health benefits here, a lot of uh, benefits for productivity as well. And it sounds like totally. it's going to be a great thing. So yeah, yeah, I really appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. It was really fun. And for that action step this week, of course, go try out intermittent fasting. Now, I've been personally experimenting with fasting for the last few months, and it has really made a difference for me. Now, Katrina offers a free download called The Six Steps to Jumpstart Your Weight Loss, and you can get her freebie on my show notes page at jeffsanders.com slash 362. Also, be sure to tune into her podcast, Weight Loss for Busy Physicians. That's all I've got for you this week here on the show. Until next time, you have the power to change your life. And the fun begins bright and early.